And I really do appreciate the, uh, but hi, I'm Justin Howe, lead pastor here at Lakeside, just in case you didn't know. Uh, Ken, our, our worship leader, um, what a thoughtful job he does on finding songs that, that declare truthfully what scripture says about Jesus. And uh, sometimes, though, you might need a dictionary. I, I, don't know, I don't know if you guys know that it's okay to look up words when you don't know what they mean. I, I was just singing with y'all the, I'm not going to try to sing it again because it would, that was nice. That would not be nice if I did that. But the Gloria in excelsis Deo, y'all know what that means, right? Thank you, Ken, who would know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As he said, glory to God in the highest or glory to God on high, uh, depending on translation. But the idea is sometimes we should sing with knowledge of what we're saying. So uh, kind of the same with scripture. When you come to the scriptures, it's okay to have a dictionary. And by the way, that sounds like a big deal to have like a big dictionary present. You know, most of you have a smartphone, right? Just if you have an Apple smartphone, you can just go, hey, Siri, define whatever word, and, and they will define the word for you. So there you go. Okay, you know, that was just bonus. Merry Christmas, my present to y'all. All right. Uh, you would turn in your Bibles to Luke, uh, Luke chapter 2. Uh, we're going to go a little bit past the birth story as we get started this morning uh, to just, just after, a few days after. Jesus, Light of the World is the title. If you would be so inclined to take notes and, and follow along, that is a, there's a space for that in the bulletin that you received. Um, kids, there's a little, little coloring thing you can kind of draw and sketch on that. And those of you that consider yourselves kids that would like to do that, you can do that and take notes. It's there for your, for your use. All right, let's pray. Let's ask for God's help on this time. Father, as we come to your word and, and we celebrate you sending your son Jesus as an infant child at this birth that we celebrate at Christmas, or we look beyond just the birth to the child that grew to a man who never once sinned, who Lord taught about how we could experience the kingdom of heaven how to have a relationship with God where we would be right with God by faith. And then we see the scriptures reveal that Jesus was put to death on a cross as though he were a criminal, though having never done anything wrong, buried and then rose from the grave. We are delighted, God, to celebrate you today. I pray that our hearts would grow in our worship and our admiration and our awe of who you are. And as we come to the text this morning, I pray for your blessing on our understanding. Lord, help us to draw closer to you. Help us to see who you are more clearly. May it erupt in a deeper praise for your character and your goodness. And I pray, God, you would win hearts for your kingdom that have yet to enter your kingdom. And Father, we pray these things and we ask in the name of Jesus, our living Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, today we're going to look at a few different descriptions of Jesus just days after he was born. Uh, the text, you, you know the story, you know Mary was this young girl, a virgin who was approached by an angel and the angel came to report the message, you're going to be pregnant with the son of the most high. You're going to name him Jesus. And, and you know that story. And then you know that she was supposed to be married. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph. And Joseph, when he found out she was pregnant and it wasn't him, he goes, I'm, I'm going to quiet. I don't want to insult her or I'm going to divorce her quietly, even though they were only engaged with a legal thing in those days. And so he was going to do that. But then and he had an angel visit him, I believe in a dream and tells him to marry her. But they, they go to Bethlehem together to be registered. You know the story. And then there was no place for them to stay. There was, there was a barn, a stable where the animals were, where they stayed. And then it was time for her to give birth. So she gave birth to Jesus. And 
We know how the angels appeared to shepherds out in fields in Bethlehem, and they proclaimed that today in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior has been born for you, which is Christ the Lord. We know that story. But did you know that eight days after his birth, which was customary for Jews to do, if they were near the temple, they would take their child and have him circumcised and dedicated to the Lord. This was the custom of the Jews and Jesus fulfilling all of the law. This was necessary for him to do. So the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 2 that they took him to Jerusalem, which is about five miles from Bethlehem. Now, let's just be honest and say, these are days you don't travel in a nice car or train, right? There's no Uber to call, and she just had a baby eight days ago. I, okay, y'all don't seem to be impressed with that. I feel like that's kind of impressive. Look, Mary, that's, she's a tough lady, all right? And then as they, they go into the temple, at some point in this part, this is where we're going to jump in. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. There's a gentleman there whose name is Simeon. It tells us this in verse 25. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation, and the Holy Spirit was on him. I just want to take a quick second and talk about Simeon here. Simeon's character, he is described as a man righteous and devout. Righteous means that he was in a right standing with God. He had lived uprightly, honored the law. Now, not perfection, not a man that doesn't need a savior, but a man that had been walking with God. And devout is the idea of one who is reverent towards God, pious, if you will, but not like bad pious, but honorable pious. He was reverent and righteous and he walked with God. And that's kind of what it tells us. The Holy Spirit was on him. The idea of the Holy Spirit being on him, there's a, there, the idea of the word there is this was an ongoing thing that started in the past and continued to the present. It wasn't like the Holy Spirit was just on him in this moment. So Simeon was a man that walked with God. And his heart, he was looking forward to something called Israel's consolation. But what is that? Well, Israel's consolation, you could look at verses in the book of Isaiah primarily where there was prophecies of hope that would come for Israel. And the words that are used are comfort, comfort my people. This is the idea that he was looking forward to Israel's comfort, Israel's peace, which he knew would only come from God. This is this man, Simeon. We don't know much about him. We don't know anything else about him. But for Luke, what mattered was his role in this story of Jesus, in his role in declaring what was true, and in saying that the Holy Spirit was on him, Luke, the author of the book of Luke, is saying there's validity to what he's saying. So listen in. And I, can we just point out, man, walking with the Spirit of God is such a valuable thing. And I think it's so easy to overlook that in the Christian life. We, we have the Word of God, and, and we, we don't always take into account the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit was exercising authority over this man, and he was in submission to the Spirit. And the Spirit of God sheds light and gives understanding. We'll see that the Spirit reveals something here in just a moment. But here we go. So let's look at that right now. Verse 26. It says, It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Verse 27 tells us, guided by the Spirit, he entered the temple. When the parents brought in the child, Jesus, to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him up in his arms, praised God, and said. And before I get to what he says, let's just pause for a second. All right, any, anyone, any mamas out there that had a, had a baby at some point in their life? And you have an eight-day-old baby. And you walk into a place that's, you know, church, let's just say church-like place, okay? And some old dude, now I'm assuming he's an old dude, it doesn't actually tell us how old he is. Some old dude comes up and takes the baby from your arms. No, no reaction? Just... But you know that this was guided by the Holy Spirit. You know, there's something, they know, they've already observed, right? The, the shepherds that showed up on the night Jesus was born, 
stinky shepherds from out in the fields gathering around, leaning in, wanting to see this baby that had been born. And here they are eight days later in the temple going, All right, here's our baby, we're performing what needs to be done. And Simeon takes him from them. But what a gift from God to this man who had been walking with God for so much time. And note carefully what was told to him. He was told he would see the Lord's Messiah before he saw death. Note that when we hear what, when God says something to us through his word, or when he says something by his spirit that aligns with his word, and we know it's his spirit, we got to be careful what understanding, uh, interpreting what he said. Might have said that, you know, Simeon could have taken the role of, well, I'll see God's salvation. So he might have interpreted, well, I'm going to see the deliverance of Israel, the outcome, the fulfillment of it. But that's not what the promise was. The promise was he would see the Lord's Messiah. So Simeon, in the spirit, walking with God, was led into the temple at just this day, at just this time. And because the reference to the temple is the outer courtyard, there's another word for the inner part of the temple. I don't think that Simeon is a priest. Some have suggested maybe he was a priest that they brought Jesus to, but I don't think that that's the case. And to the parents, this stranger comes and takes the baby, eight-day-old baby Jesus, into his arms. And this man that had been walking with God in righteousness and reverence in fellowship with the Spirit of God, having been guided by the Spirit, the Spirit revealed he would see the Lord's Messiah, and he guided him there at just the right time, at just the right moment and place, and he sees the Lord's Messiah. Today, the title is Jesus, Light of the World, and we're going to look at three different descriptions. One is the Lord's Messiah. The Lord's Messiah. This is who was in the hands of Simeon, the one he describes as the Lord's Messiah. So what is a Messiah? A Messiah is a savior, someone who delivers. It is the anointed one. And and the word in Greek is Christos. Does that sound familiar? It's, It's the word Christ that we interpret as Christ. Did you know, and I think I've said it before, and you've probably heard it before, but just a reminder, Christ is not the last name of Jesus. It is a description. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the anointed one. Jesus, the Christ is what it means. It's, it's a description of who he is and what, his, what role he performs. He is the Savior, the Messiah. And so the Simeon holds him. He says, this is the Lord's Savior. This is the one the Lord has sent to rescue people. This is what he is seeing and, and feeling all in this moment. Simeon looking for a Savior, but not just any Savior. You know, we've been through the book of Judges the last several months here as a church, and and God raised up several saviors during that time, several deliverers, little s, not not the one. And there was times that it went really well, and the land had rest, and, and then the cycle continued where they fell back into sin and continued on. This is different. This is the Savior. This is the one who would save all who would believe. This is a special Savior. God could have raised up another deliverer of of a smaller stature to rescue them from the Romans, but this time is so much different. So why doesn't it say Israel's Messiah? Why doesn't it say Israel's Savior in this moment? Because the emphasis is that this Savior is from the Lord of Israel. This is the Lord's Savior. This is the one the Lord is providing, and it is not just to Israel. Verse 29. Simeon is saying this now. He goes, now, master, you can dismiss your servant in peace as you promised. You can let me die, is what he says. I've seen you have fulfilled your promise to me. Thank you, God. Now I can die in peace. I have seen your salvation. Verse 30, that's what he says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. That's the second description of Jesus, light of the world today, is he is your salvation. Salvation. 
Do you know that in life, for us to see something, it requires light? His, this salvation is light. Simeon was holding the light of the world, and he saw that with his spiritual eyes revealed by the Holy Spirit in that moment. Light reveals things that are in darkness, and we need to look at the source of spiritual light if we want to see. In other words, without Jesus, without looking to Jesus, you can't see. You can't see spiritually without recognizing Jesus as King, as Savior and Lord. So this salvation is being revealed And this salvation is a clarifying statement. It's a clarifying expression of what he's already said when Luke said that he was, that Simeon was looking forward to Israel's consolation. He's saying he was looking forward to this salvation that Simeon declares. So Israel's consolation is salvation. It is forgiveness of sins. And this salvation is this person, this Jesus. So Jesus is is salvation. It is the love. He is the love of God expressed to mankind, revealed in this moment in a baby. Pure light. Kind of gives a little imagery thought to that phrase out of that one Christmas song, radiant beams from thy holy face. Verse 31. Simeon continues his his declaration. He goes, you have prepared it. Salvation, that is. You have prepared it in the presence of all peoples. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. So there's really two pieces there, but I made this the third point, a light. He is a light for revelation to the Gentiles. He is the Lord's Messiah. He is your salvation. And he is a light for revelation to the Gentiles. And this is an important one for us. Salvation for all people is what this is. And he prepared it in the presence of all peoples. And the word peoples here, he uses the largest dividing factor. So this is your large, broad nations. You know, we might describe them as different countries of people, large groups of people. And then when he goes from that of all peoples, he goes, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. And Gentiles is an interesting translation because the word is actually the ethnos, ethnicities. It is the people groups. It is a salvation for all people groups. And any people group that was not Jewish or Israelite at this time was considered Gentile outside of without God. And now they are being invited into the family to receive by faith God's gift of salvation. So Jesus, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, is the revealing of salvation for all people. And that includes you and me today. He is our light for revelation. Light shining on an object reveals it. It makes it known. It uncovers it. And this salvation has been uncovered. It has been revealed for all people By the light that was shining on it. The light is Jesus. Jesus is both the light and the salvation. And what an amazing message to think about coming from the Israelite temple courtyard. The Israelite temple courtyard, the place where only Jews were allowed to enter and only the one tribe could even enter the temple and only one person of that tribe who was selected could enter the holiest place of that temple for their relationship with God, for their interaction with God. And now it declared in the courtyard that Jesus is the light of the whole world, not just for Jews. What an amazing message. And he says, he ties that a light for revelation to the Gentiles and glory to your people, Israel. Israel is not abandoned and cast aside and made unimportant, no. In fact, the light being revealed to all peoples actually sheds glory on God's people, the Israelites. This salvation, which includes Jews, is actually glory. It is special recognition to God's people, Israel. These are people who played a unique role in God's story of redemption. Let me read a few passages from Isaiah. 
Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5 says, And the glory of the Lord will appear, and all humanity together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. See, when God's glory shines, it's seen by all people. Isaiah 60, verses 1 through 3 says, Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord shines over you. See, God's glory and light goes together. And he says in verse 2 of that passage of Isaiah 60, For look, darkness will cover the earth, and total darkness the people's. See, we're walking around in darkness, unable to find the way. We cannot get to salvation on our own. We need the light. But the Lord will shine over you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations will come to your light and kings to your shining brightness. And this is the beginning of that fulfillment as Simeon stands there declaring that Jesus is the light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory to God's people Israel. It's a beautiful moment. Isaiah chapter 60 verse 19 says, the sun will no longer be your light by day and the brightness of the moon will not shine on you. The Lord will be your everlasting light and God will be your splendor. When God's light shines on us, we merely reflect his light and that's how his glory shines on his people. We reflect his light. And when his light is shining on his people and people see that there's something there, it draws them in to go, show me that light. When you're walking in darkness and it is incredibly dark all around you and you look and you see a light in the distance, it gives you hope and you want to go find that light. I think of a time I was in a cave deep in, deep in the ground and, and you know the whole thing that they do in those deep caves, they want to, they want to show you how scary it can be. You ever been in one of those deep caves where they go in there and they're like, okay, everyone's safe. We're standing right here. Don't go anywhere. And they flip off the lights. Man, talk about darkness. Darkness in which you, you put your hand in front of your face. You don't even see the movement. You see nothing. My wife who was standing next to me she could have been a thousand miles away. It was so dark. I just didn't, I couldn't see, couldn't feel. The darkness felt. It was heavy. And I remember on the way down to that place where they shut the lights off, there was a narrow passageway on which on the other side was like a 200-foot fall. And I knew if they didn't get the lights back on, we were going to be in trouble. But man, all it takes, you know, someone's watch lights up. Someone checked their watch. And the little glow of that little indigo light was like, whoa, I'm going to go stand over there. But God's light is so much greater, so much more glorious, and he is the light. He is the only way we can be saved. He is the only way the people on the other side of those walls that are driving past the church, that are celebrating Christmas in other ways or not celebrating Christmas at all, it's the only way they can spend an eternity with Jesus. So let us declare God's salvation to them. This passage with Simeon concludes that with, he gives his declaration of amazing truth and then the passage summarizes up in verses 33 to 35. It says, his father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Yeah, no kidding. And then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary. Interesting, he turns to Mary, not Joseph. Not both of them, just Mary. He told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and the rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I don't know about you guys, if I, was in, if I was Joseph in that moment, this would be cryptic and what are you saying? It, it, this would have been interesting to hear, but as we have the luxury of history and the rest of scriptures to reveal to us, the rise and fall of many, really Luke is saying, here's your opportunity to respond, people. You hear, you've seen what this man has declared about Jesus. He is the light of the world, God's salvation, the Lord's Messiah, the light of revelation to the Gentiles. And 
glory to God's people Israel. You know this is who he is, but, but, but know this. He will cause the fall of many and the rise of many. You see, some people hear the message of Jesus and they just can't get it. They just can't accept it. They just won't embrace him as king. And so that is their downfall. They stumble over him and won't accept him. And yet there are others who have been rejected God for so much of their life, made a mess of their life, been of no value to anybody, you could, you could argue. And yet God, in his mercy and wonderful wisdom, raises them up and saves them and cleans them up and clothes them in righteousness. He causes the fall of many and the rise of many. Isaiah 8.14 says, He will be a sanctuary, referring to the future Messiah. He would be a sanctuary, but for the two houses of Israel, He will be a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over and a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Do you know that Jesus can cause you to trip up? The idea of the, Jesus, the Messiah, causes many to trip up. But he also rescues many. A sign that will be opposed. Jesus gave so many indications that he was the Son of God, the, the Messiah, the salvation of Israel. And you know, he was accused of many things. He was accused of being born out of sexual immorality. By the way, he had no control over how he was, well, that's not entirely true. Most people are not have any control over how they're born, but Jesus is different because he's the son of God. But his mom was a virgin and the Holy Spirit did this. So no sexual immorality possible there. Claimed his miracles were done by the power of Satan at one point. You remember that? Oh, you, this is by Satan's power. You did what you did. Not false, right? A sign that will be opposed, accused him of having a demon and even being a Samaritan. Oh, that's one of the worst things they could have said about Jesus. And Jesus having a demon and driving out demons. What? And even as he died, as he hung on the cross, he was mocked and spat upon, lied about. Uh, and, and when he rose from the grave, people lied about him then that he, you know, his disciples stole him away and and buried him somewhere else. So, Jesus is a polarizing figure. But then he's, Simeon looks at Mary and goes, a sword will pierce your own soul. There's several things that could be meant here. One, Joseph, the, his adopted dad, doesn't seem to be alive beyond Jesus' adult ministry, so appears he dies early. Didn't live to see the day that Jesus would die a horrific death on the cross, but Mary was around. Imagine being the mom of, of this child, the child of God, the child of the, the son of the most high, to have to observe, to deal with the reality of her son being crucified. Knowing he'd never done anything wrong. Maybe even more importantly, though, that message that Jesus brought that causes many to trip and stumble and others to be risen up had to pierce her heart, too. The work of the Holy Spirit had to, had to go in and convict her of her own sin and need for salvation also. At one point, someone cries out to Jesus in a crowd as he was teaching and instructing and healing. In Luke 11, verse 27, it says, as he was saying these things, a woman from the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the one who nursed you. Blessed is your mom. And he said in verse 28, Rather, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Even Mary would have to respond to the word of her son, of the word of God. The thoughts of many hearts revealed, you know, that's not a comforting thought. It can actually be kind of frightening to know that God will reveal every thought of your heart. And he will judge down to our very thoughts when we stand before him in judgment one day. Even those thoughts will be revealed. And the wonder of salvation is that Jesus will transform us from the inside out, including renovating our minds so that our thoughts become more like his. Jesus transforms the whole person. 
So I just want to say this today as we go out. Jesus is the Lord's Messiah. He is our salvation. He was and is the light of revelation of uncovering the reality of salvation to us, to all peoples. And there's no better time than right now to begin a relationship with Jesus if you've never begun a relationship with Jesus. And there's no better time to just be more in awe and more amazed at who God is than now. So I invite you to respond to God. I want to pray for you and give you a chance to respond. Lord, I, give, I come to you this morning thankful, God, for your word, thankful for this season of Christmas to reflect upon Christ Jesus incarnate, God in the flesh, providing for us salvation. Salvation was you. You are the light of the world. I pray, God, that we would walk with you more faithfully. I pray, God, that your light would shine on us and reflect into the world and draw more people to your light. God, I pray we would not put your light under a basket. We wouldn't hide it. We wouldn't suffocate it, but we would let it shine. So, God, today I pray that you would continue your work by your Spirit in me and in each person here in this morning, here at home, on the radio, online, Lord, those so many people we want to see walk with you faithfully, growing in you, experiencing the joy of your salvation. We come to you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.